Ladies and gentlemen, today it's really a big, big pleasure because I have Jim Rambach together with me. Hi, Jim. How are you? Hello, Greg. How are you doing? Very well. Super happy and super thrilled to kick off the discussion together with you. But in advance, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. I know that you are fully booked, but you found time to speak on my podcast, on the CX Goalkeeper podcast. Super proud and super happy that you accepted that. Thank you. It's my honor. And I know that you're also a fellow podcaster. You have a podcast since several years. We will deep dive on that. But before we start deep diving in today's topic, innovation in B2B revenue generation using CX, the success of modern day sales in extending frontiers of CX knowledge. Um, and we would like to learn about a bit more about you. You are today's top player and therefore my short question. Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, I uh, Sure, I'll do that for a brief moment. I actually have two uh, things that are kind of close and, and passionate to me. Um, I do have an online leadership academy for frontline leaders and, and supervisors and managers, and sometimes directors uh, in customer care and um, types of environment uh, called Call Center Coach. Uh, and it's a blended learning environment where people can actually do get multi what they refer to as multimodal learning. Uh, and it really focuses on the whole leadership element. Uh, and and then the other thing I have is uh, we really focus in on helping high ticket B two B marketers and sellers that are struggling with prospecting and lead generation stand out, qualify, and build trusted relationships with senior level decision makers ten times faster with lower customer acquisition costs. And we do it. Uh, with the foundation of customer experience, and we refer to it as prospect experience, which is a total game changer. That's uh, super interesting, and I'm looking forward to deep dive into into this topic. But before we 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 start discussing about it, we would like to learn more about you. Which values drive you in life? Well, I, I guess throughout the course of my life, some of those have shifted to some degree, uh, but some were really instilled with me by my parents and their parents and their parents before them. Uh, a lot of those values, oftentimes we find travel with us as part of, you know, just our our natural, you know, growth, um, as well as, you know, um, I guess you'd say instruction and conditioning. If you want to call it brainwashing, so what? As long as it's for the greater good. Uh, so for me, trust integrity, innovation, and commitment. Um, I'm a very, very loyal and committed type of you know, individual. My wife and I will be celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary. Um, and I have people saying all the time, wow, there's not too many people at your age, and I'm 55, uh, totally transparent on that, you know, who've been married that long. Uh, and, and so for me, you know, the words in regards to death to us part, I committed to that. Very, very interesting. And I think I can add one value that I'm sure, sure that you are sharing is passion for what you are doing. Because watching your videos, listening to your podcast, so many, so many episodes. And also, uh, for example, looking through your uh, LinkedIn profile and what you're doing into your academy, it's incredible the passion that you are putting in, into, into what you are doing. Um, perhaps one thing that stands out, uh, please, do you want to share something? I would even add to that. I mean, so, you know, for some of us, especially in our youth, when we have a lot of passion, that could also be seen as a negative if we don't direct it. So as I've gotten older, I've learned how to direct it a little bit better, be a little bit more patient um, and talk about, and we'll talk about something that I think has become critical for me that everybody else needs to focus in on as well. So please go ahead. Uh, very interesting. I, I wanted quickly to ask you about your podcast. Could you please share where we can find it and what are the main topics that you are discussing there? So I have two, because uh, I talked about my two, you know, my two passions in regards to call center coach, uh, and then also what we're doing at peerroundtables.com. Uh, I have the Fast Leader Show at fastleader.net, where we focus in on customer experience um, from the employee experience perspective, as well as that customer experience expect, uh, perspective. And we look at it from a lot of different viewpoints, including creative thinking and innovation. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that are we, we need to be thinking about in regards to impacting the customer experience that oftentimes we just don't consider. Uh, and then the other one being the, the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, where I focus in on 
how can we make, you know, better experiences from a marketing and selling perspective? And how can we kind of clear up the mess uh, that we have in regards to the different technologies and practices and things like that? Because much like in prospect experience, as well as customer experience, we do things that we think are going to make a positive impact, but in fact, erode our opportunities to deliver on that customer experience. Thank you, Jim. And for, for first call to action for the audience, after, after listening to these episodes, go please to Jim's uh, podcast and subscribe them, follow them, because they are full of interesting things, interesting discussion with thought leaders in, in the two different fields, contact center and sales. Now let's kick off the game and let's start speaking about innovation in B2B revenues generation using CX, the success of modern day sales in extending the frontiers of CX knowledge. Uh, it's a quite complicated topic. Let's structure them. How can you leverage CX in the context of the B2B uh, revenue generation? Well, I think it's really important to know that there's really been um, five different, as they refer to as revenue strategies that organizations can implement uh, in in order to be able to you know have that that top line growth, and then if they manage it effectively, have bottom line growth as well. Uh, so these five vital growth strategies are acquisition, winbacks, margins, retention, and expansion, and. There's different things that are occurring within every single one of those types of revenue opportunities. And if we approach that from the perspective of that customer experience and prospect experience and look at it as a unified journey, I mean, we have a prospect journey, we have a buyer's journey, and then we have a customer journey. We're, we're actually going to be significantly more effective at attracting retaining, uh, as well as getting customers referred to us. And I think more and more, you're starting to see some of the leading organizations kind of step back and look at their overall strategy and say, hmm, we can't treat somebody the same through all of these. It's just not going to work. So for example, if we over automate and we treat prospects as objects, and we don't take into consideration that, especially in high ticket B2B sales, the reason that people will end up choosing to do business with us is because of the relationship that we end up creating and nurturing, you know, and then look at it from that buyer's journey, we need to continue to build that trust. And then from a customer journey perspective, we need to deliver on that trust expectation and then always make them feel like we appreciate the fact that they're doing business with us so that we can retain them and then therefore, therefore, they will have the trust to refer us to other people. It's really a continuum. And we have to look at it as an overall ecosystem and be focused in on the customer, not our company and not our brand, throughout the entire journey. I really like what you're saying because often uh, companies focus on an acquisition and the usual example is they are creating big discount for a new customer joining the company but they are doing nothing for the existing customers because they they have their they are paying their monthly um, subscription and so on and therefore they are doing nothing and what you are really sharing it's throughout the complete journey from the beginning to the end covering the customer and focusing on them that's really really important well and you bring up a really interesting point because you said the word membership right um so when i am thinking about the different types of products and services that i have available uh, to our to our customers and our, our potential customers how we go about implementing our strategy and the tactics that are going to be put in place is very, very different if I have more of what is referred to as a transactional type of sale. I mean, it's a, a very simple purchase process uh, and it doesn't require a whole lot of an involvement for them from a, either an onboarding or implementation perspective or even a purchase decision perspective. That's a little bit more transactional. So therefore, I would take a little bit different approach. I have a different strategy because of what I'm, what I'm providing. How, however, if I have a high ticket you know, type of solution where we're talking several thousands of dollars and maybe some reoccurring revenue beyond that. That's a very, very different approach you need to take. If you take a transactional type of approach in a high ticket sale, you will not sell and you will churn customers. 
And if you do the do look at it from a different perspective, if I have a transactional, you know, type of relationship with somebody, if I spend a high degree of effort through the acquisition and all these other areas, I may actually cost myself out of the business. So, so you, you really have to be able to look at what is it that we're providing? What's the price points? Who's involved? Again, it comes back to that whole prospect experience, customer experience, buyer experience. All of that has to be considered. Very, very nice. This this really understanding of who is in front of you and what you are offering. It's it's key. And now we have really a lot of changes, a lot of innovation and 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 so on. What groundbreaking CX innovation have you seen or implemented in B2B revenue growth? So there's uh, um, there's a couple different things that that for me stand out when you start talking about that. And and again, you 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 kind of also have to go and look at those different you know revenue opportunities. Um, there are impactful experiences and and results that have happened. You know, in a win back ex- scenario, um, in a you talked about costs and cutting a cost for a particular client. You know, but when you start thinking about margins, which is what you're referring to. Um, going back to that whole relationship component and understanding and understanding the customer and getting them and helping them, I guess you could also say, come to the decision that they need a solution such as yours to be able to fix the problem that they're dealing with day in and day out. And you've captured that trust earlier in that consideration uh, portion of, of them actually trying to fix this problem you're not going to get into a battle of cost. You're not going to have to do a lot of discounting because you've eliminated your competition from from actual consideration because you are the one that actually built the relationship. You are the one that they trust. And the key is to always be helping them to try to solve the problems that they're trying to fix, not sell your solution or push your brand. Those are very two different approaches to take. And the ones that end up winning in the short term and the long term are the ones where that prospect and that buyer will say, you know what, I think you're really looking out for me. You really understand me. Because ultimately, people do business with people. Um, some people will say it's not B2B, it's not B2C, it's H to H, human to human. Okay, that, that's great. If that's what helps you to have uh, that, you know, that focus point in order to be able to you know, accomplish your business objectives as well as your customers, um, then actually take that approach uh, and be able to permeate that throughout every single portion, that prospect journey, buyer journey, customer journey, and even in that lost customer situation, um, because you never know what the drivers are that are causing or that have caused a company to not do business with you uh, further. Sometimes it could be just as simple as, for example, a cash flow crunch. Oh, I have to, unfortunately, because of cash flow situations, I have to scale back. Well, well, what happens if they do a good job of that and it rebounds? You want them to come back. And so if you have a good experience, even in a lost customer scenario, the, the, op, the opportunities for you to have the win back increase significantly. And oftentimes customers go to somebody else and then come back because they tried something new and they can come back. And therefore also this part of the journey is extremely important. First of all, thank you very much for sharing this example, but also to mention the sentence that I have on my webpage. That's the first sentence that it's on my webpage. It's not B2B, it's not B2C, it's human to human because this is the relationship. And what I really like and enjoy and the deepness of the discussion, what you are sharing. We are speaking about innovation and you didn't start speaking about uh, chat GPT, AI, and when it is and that technology. I know you are laughing for the people, for the audience only li- uh, listening to this podcast, but the reality, everybody speaks only about technology and you condensed everything to relationship, building relationship and, and leveraging trust. And I think this is ex- the most important thing and the basics for everything. Well, and let's go let's go back to the, the big argument or the big worry you could even say in regards to AI or artificial intelligence, chat, GTP. And oh, by the way, there's a lot of companies that have now uh, launched and are getting funded to be chat, GTP direct competitors. So 
we're talking chat GTP today, but we probably won't be talking chat GTP 12 months from now. It's going to be some other organization. Uh, and so everybody needs to know that. We are at the very, very beginning of this AI, if you want to call it transformation, revolution, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and you know, you see a lot of statistics about you know companies saying that they've already implemented you know AI. Well, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, we're still at the very, very beginning of all of this. And what we do run the risk of is something that CX professionals have always come in to uh, as a potential risk. And that is I, I replace humans and I lose the human touch. I lose the humanity. Now the, the people who are our prospects, buyers, and customers become objects. Technology can help you accelerate treating people like objects faster than anything else. And so you have to be really careful. Uh, also, too, when you start looking at it from a competitive landscape, the companies that do have the focus and strategy of, hey, let's just get more do you know, and do more with not looking at the augmentation piece, like how do we become more human and then use the AI tools to augment and help us to deliver on our humanity. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're going to increase in number. The, the push button companies using AI uh, are going to continue to increase because they're only going to look at it from the efficiency aspects of their balance sheet. Those companies are going to lose in the long run. They will become extinct. So, it, it is absolutely a scenario of you know, we need to put AI in the proper context. AI is not going to replace you. AI could absolutely enhance you if you allow it. Personal experience and what you're hearing, I know that you're also active on LinkedIn and to the audience, please follow Jim on also on LinkedIn. I am getting much more inquiries and DMs from AI bots and bots asking me and trying to sell me something. And if you could at least check my profile, understand what I'm doing. I am not a consultant. I have a corporate job. I have a podcast. Please offer me something related to what I'm doing. And what you are saying, it's it's key. I know that statistics can be always faked and you can change them. But what I read and I still continue reading is most people take decisions, buying decisions on emotional basis. In, 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 in my language, stomach-based and not based on the logic. And therefore, also there, AI cannot influence emotion at the moment, and therefore it can enhance people, it can support processes, but it's not the way to go. Well, the emotion that it actually evokes is the one that you don't want. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's true. <laughs> Thank you very much. And how leaders can be uh, forward thinking and ante anticipate the needs and preferences of their customer to drive sales? You know, uh, I think it's we have to be really cautious um, because forward thinkers look at what you're referring to when you look at the word anticipate quite differently. So forward thinkers don't anticipate and think on behalf of the customer, the prospect, the buyer, uh, the actual customer. That's not what they do. What they do, the forward thinkers don't do that anticipation. They know that, hey, I can't say, and this is what I hear all the time, well, I know if that happened to me, I wouldn't like it. Well, I know if that happened to me, I would like it. It ain't about you, right? It's about your prospect, your buyer, your customer. And and so therefore that check is to say, okay, I, I need to use data in order to, to help me understand what action should be taken here. And then also when you look at data, unfortunately what, again, the conditioning of the CX industry is that, you know, hey, we do surveys and we do, you know, we, we collect this type of data, but here's what they don't do an effective job of, and that's collecting the qualitative information. They'll collect the quantitative, but, you know, the, the quantitative data, the numbers are the what. The qualitative data is why are the numbers the way that they are? That's the why. And unfortunately, the, a lot of organizations make decisions off of the what, the number. Instead of looking at the why, well, why did they actually do it that way? And for, for many of us, if we're consumers, you know, oftentimes when we go to the places where we do our online shopping, we'll just take an Amazon example. Um, 
is, and I asked somebody this question the other day. So when you're going and you're thinking about purchasing a particular product on, on Amazon, I said, and you look at all those customer reviews, I said, what do you do first? And he says, well, I look at all the top five number. And I said, no, you don't. He goes, what? I said, you look at all the ones. He goes, you're right, I do. And that's what most of us do. We look at those lower numbers. And so, you know, why do they rate it a one? Why did they rate it a three? And a lot of times you'll see within that qualitative information, something that was totally unrelated to what you were actually thinking about and the reasons why you would buy. So if you just took that number and didn't buy, that would could be the wrong decision because you didn't look at the qualitative information where the person was saying, hey, this is a great product. Um, you know, the price was was, you know, not as much, not as much as I wanted to pay, but the quality still is there. This re review is just for the pricing issue. Would you pay for higher quality? You darn right you would. So for whatever reason, this person chose to rate it a three, where you would say, hmm, that's still five to category for me. Again, if we, we don't rely and we don't try to answer questions on behalf of the customer, we have to really focus is, focus in on uh, something uh, that Oded Netzer, who was an author of the book, Decisions um, uh, Over Decimals, talked about is he said, we need to do a better job at building our skills of what he calls IWICS, I-W-I-K-S, IWICS, I wish I knew. And we have to be really careful as leaders to say, hmm, okay, well, this is what I think I know, but I wish I knew what the customer really thought about this, what the prospect really thought about this, what the buyer really thought about this. What is their top of mind? You know, it may not be my solution. Also too, when you start talking about problem solving, a lot of times all of us get stuck in the symptom and don't realize that it's two or three or four steps before that, that would actually fix the problem. And that's where we need to be focusing. It's because, no, 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 this thing's garnering most of my time, but it's four or five steps away. I need to solve for that. Eh, that, that well, that'll get solved if you actually go four steps you know, previous. And that's where the whole, when you start talking about complex solutions and to solve complex problems comes into play, is an education process needs to, to, come, to, to actually take place. Well, what do you need in order to help people to come to the realization you know, about their problem and solving their problem? You got to have trust. You don't get that from push button. That's not an AI thing, right? It's the same thing if you think about contact resolution in a contact center environment. You know, you already know things about me. Why do I have to consistently repeat it? And it's not a security issue, right? Oh. You, I mean, you, you, so we start thinking about all of these things. And like I said, it translates. There's humans all the way through that continuum prospect, buyer, customer. And we have to be making sure that we're focused on them with facts, not anticipation. It totally makes sense. And it's it's really clear. And therefore, I'm keen to ask this question. Uh, can you share a case where CX directly boosted B2B revenues? And what are the key lessons that you have? You know, I, um, no, I was thinking about this. Um, Um, and there's there's a couple key key things that I often see as as issues that people struggle with. One is that thinking that brand awareness drives revenues. Your brand doesn't matter until it matters. And so if we just go and try to push brand, you know, it could have the boomerang effect. And a lot of people don't think that they even have a chance because nobody knows our brand. And that's just not true. Because again, if I do a better job of connecting, nurturing, and building and educating, you know, those the relation, you know, from a relationship uh, relationship perspective and helping them to solve their problem, the brand's not going to matter. So if you look at it from a spend perspective and investment perspective, most you know, marketers and sellers, they're spending about 80% of their re of their um their money on trying to build their brand. That's ill spend where what they should be doing is yes. I'm not saying don't spend and try to build brand. That's not what I'm saying, but it should be on focusing in on your prospects and your buyers, getting to understand them 
to a degree that your competitors just can't do or won't do or didn't do. And that spending money in that effort is actually going to get you significantly greater revenues. The other thing is playing in a red ocean. Too, too many people essentially are, are putting themselves in the mix of what everybody else is doing. And then they're wondering why they can't stand out and why they can't be different. The same thing happens when you start talking about customer, customer retention. There's a lot, uh, if you're not doing well and serving them well, there's a lot of competitors out there and people, and you look at the research studies, brand loyalty is continuing to drop. People will jump quick. Why? Because you don't know me. You're not serving me. You're not, I don't trust you. All of those things come into play. It's the H to H thing, the human to human thing. The other thing is not separating out short-term versus long-term. So if we think about B2B sellers, oftentimes they're focused in on the short-term, right? I need to hit my numbers and I need to hit them now, much like a contact center. I need to hit my numbers and I need to hit them now. Where some things you have to say, if I do this, it actually is going to impact the long term and give me greater opportunity down the road from a growth perspective. We see the same thing in leadership development. If you're not going to put in the effort to develop your leaders in a way by which that's effective, how do you think you're going to impact your turnover numbers? How do you think you're going to impact you know, the numbers that are associated with effectiveness within your contact center? Because if you look at all the research, it says that 80% of the reason why people leave, 80% of why 80% of the reason why they perform is because of the relationship they have with their immediate supervisor. Hello. If you don't invest in that, you're gonna you're, you're gonna have long-term negative impacts. So you have to be able to separate, okay, what can I expect in the short term? What do I or what must and what is vital for me to look at in the long term? to impact this prospect experience, buyer experience, and customer experience. And then the other thing is, especially we, we see this in a, in a lot of different ways on the CX side, as well as the PX side, prospect, prospect experience. And that is we try to throw people across the, across, the creek, across the creek. And we don't think about it as in stepping stones. Remember, we talk about trust being an underpinning. Trust isn't immediate. It has to be grown. You may be able to borrow some perceived trust on the front end because maybe I was referred by one of my friends. Okay, I borrowed that trust. But I have to be able to nurture it and then therefore retain it. That's stepping stones across the creek. In a buying situation, most B2B organizations, when you start talking about high ticket, actually have buying committees, buying teams. There's several people involved. And so while I may have initially been interacting with one part of the organization or one champion or one, uh, one, you know, key title within an organization, because they're responsible for something in regards to my solution or service, when other people start coming on board as part of that decision-making process, I can't keep pushing it forward to the next stone. Sometimes I have to go back one. Sometimes I have to go back two. From a customer experience perspective, you know, um, we're having problems with, um, if I have a software scenario, um, with, you know, user adoption, user effectiveness. Well, we went through an onboarding process. Well, guess what? Maybe we need to do it again, right? Also, they're dealing with churn. <laughs> so has that been part of your, your actual focus in regards to making sure that they're getting the best return on investment for your solution? It's, it still comes back to the human to human. If I'm not doing a good job of focusing in on the people, I'm not going to win. I'm not going to win in the short term, I'm not going to win in the long term. Most decisions in, the, in B2B sales right now are being lost to no decision. To no decision. The stakes in B2B purchasing are significantly higher than they are in B2C because my job's on the line, my reputation's on the line. Heck, maybe my people's well-being is on the line. It's not my money, right? All of those factors cause the stakes and, ca and cause the bar to be much higher in regards to the relationship. And again, AI push button, you think you're ever going to build that? It's never going to happen.
Thank you, Jim. It's, it's really interesting. These are key learnings that uh, people, the audience can really profit from and, and understand and also understanding the difference between B2B and B2C. Uh, perhaps speaking about the future, how do you see the future of CX in B2B sales and what advice would you offer to newcomers? So um, I had a mentor of mine who was in the customer experience measurement space uh, for many, many years. And I happened to be in a conversation with her and she was talking about basic fundamentals in regards to measuring the customer experience and taking action upon it. And after the call concluded, I had the opportunity to talk with her afterwards. And I, and I said, how are you doing? Because she's, she seemed a little bit irritated and she goes, sometimes when people just can't see the clarity in regards to the customer experience and taking action upon it. I get a little bit frustrated and I've been talking about this for 20 years. And I said to her, I said, and if you're going to be in business for the next 20, you'll be talking about it all along the way. It's never going to change. So asking me the question about where are we going to be in 10 years, the customer experience has been continuing to decline. Employee experience and employee turnover hasn't seen any movement or changes. If any, it's been a decline. We're going to see the same thing in B2B marketing and selling. More and more organizations are going to struggle to make contacts, uh, to make conversions, to fill their sales pipeline, because they're going to be implementing AI in order to be more efficient. They're going to be doing all these things that are going to get further and further away from being able to deliver you know, to the human. And so we're going to be, my fear is in a worse state because more and more companies are getting heavily funded to provide push button relationships in regards to marketing and selling. Same thing with customer experience. And so all of the marketing information that's out there, all the educational information that's out there, if you're a newcomer, if you're, you're confronted and overwhelmed with, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. Kind of goes back to what you were saying a moment ago, Greg, where people think it's technology that's going to fix their problems. Oftentimes, the problem starts with the whole strategy component. Are you treating your customers as objects or humans? You know, how are you actually viewing them? And and so what, you know, it may, it may not be the same in what, in what you're saying from a mission and vision perspective. You know, because so many companies will say that we're focused in on providing an excellent customer experience. Yeah. Uh, prove it. Let's look at all the metrics that you're using in order to manage your business. Am I seeing that in your metrics? And most of the time, the answer is no, they're not. Uh, they're, they're looking at ways by which to, you know, hopefully reduce costs to their lowest, you know, point, um, you know, with the hopes that it's actually going to deliver greater re revenue. It's just not going to happen. Thank you. And you are the perfect guest because you also you are also a podcast host and you anticipated the next question because you watch on the timing. And therefore, that's that's perfect. We are coming to an end of this discussion, but I still have two questions for you. What's the best way to contact you? So for me, um, you can contact me on LinkedIn. You had mentioned that. Um, you can also send me an email at jim at peerroundtables.com or jim at call center coach, depending on what your area of interest is. Um, and then you can also, uh, you know, like I said, just connect with me and just send me a note on, on LinkedIn. As I did, and now you are a guest of my podcast. And therefore, I know that it, it, it really works. We are coming to the last question. Is Jim's golden nugget, it's something that we discussed or something new to leave to the audience? So I, I, everybody has referred to uh, Albert Einstein's quote associated with, in, you know, insanity, doing the same thing over and again, you know, and expecting a dis different result, something along those lines, you know, that's insanity. Um, well, when I th start thinking about really from an employee perspective, a career perspective, uh, and, and as well as from a, a B2B marketers and sellers perspective, Let's look at that in a little bit different way. And my adaptation that somebody actually introduced to me was insanity is doing the same thing as everyone else and expecting to stand out. If you look like everyone else, if you're doing like everyone else, 
you won't stand out. Now, so then the question is, what do I want to stand out for? Right. Um, we can be quite ugly, you know, and stand out for that reason. But is that going to get you the outcomes you desire? Not likely. Right. So if we think about, again, prospect experience, buyer experience, customer experience, and everything that goes along with that acquisition, retention, win back referrals, margins, all of that. If you look like everyone else, do you think you're going to win in those revenue opportunities? It's not going to happen. And what's the differentiator then? It's knowing that my customer knows I care about them. And I want them to be successful. Them first. It ain't about me. The only thing that I can say is thank you very much, Jim, for this golden nugget. Please stay with me to the audience for today. It's everything. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion. For me, it, it, there were great insights where I can learn a lot about B2B, about sales growth, but also about call center. That's my old passion uh, call center. I worked there uh, uh, many years. And therefore, thank you very much, Jim, for your time. We really appreciate feedback. If you have any feedback, please feel free to contact Jim or to contact me. Thank you very much. And Jim, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much and bye-bye.